If you have your Bible, I want you to open it very quickly, the book of Esther. Last week, we studied the book of Esther, chapter Esther. Th- <laughs> yeah, we did. We studied the third chapter of the book of Esther, and we, got, uh, we, we began to see what was happening. It really is the crux of the book. Esther, as you know, in the third year of Xerxes, or Ahasuerus is the other name we call him. Well, I, the, I like Xerxes because it's easier to say. When Xerxes was in his third year as a, as a king, you remember he had a banquet, lasted for six months. During that period of time, he had called his queen Vashti to come forward and parade herself in front of a group of drunken men who'd been drinking for a week, and they were pretty well polluted. She said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not a concubine. I'm a queen, and he deposed her. Uh, in the seventh year, as you remember, four years had passed. He got lonely. They sent out a decree, said, bring your pr- prettiest young virgins from all over the 127 pr- provinces uh, of Iran, of, of, of Persia, Medo-Persian Empire. They showed up, and obviously out of that, Esther... Uh, was the prettiest of them all. She became queen of King Ahasuerus in his fourth year, uh, seventh year of his reign. So then in the twelfth year of his reign, where we're going to pick up tonight, by the time he'd been, she'd been in the palace now five years. Uh, she's got her flowers where she wants them. She has her sofas where she likes them. Her pictures are hung on the wall. She's got her servants pretty well trained. She's living the good life five years into the journey. She's learned what she likes to eat and doesn't want to eat. She, her servants know very well, well what time she likes to get up in the morning and when she likes to go to bed at night. She's got all her pattern down. The days of being the poor little girl out, the girl out in the country are gone. And she's moved up to city life and from all indications she likes it. The dilemma is about the time you get really good and settled, there'll be always be a fly in the ointment, right? You get a, a comfortable chair and there'll be a mosquito come buzz you, or you get real uh, comfortable in boat and 14 people come by on jet skis. You know what I'm saying. So no matter where you are, sooner or later, something's going to rock your world. And she was going along very, very well, and suddenly a man named Haman, who just appears. We don't have a whole lot of background on who he is or what he is. Don't know if he's a banking buddy. I don't know if he's a drinking buddy. I don't know if he was a, a somebody that done business, a lot of business for the king. But suddenly he shows up and he earns the right, or he's given the, he doesn't earn the right, he's given the title, second in command of the king. That's a powerful, powerful, powerful position. Uh, the person who's your second in command can either make you or break you. He can say the king said, and the king didn't say, but it's far as good as the king saying it because I represent the king. And you remember the story, everybody was bowing down, the inference is, and I'm going to give you the recap quickly of Esther 3. They were, the people were told to bow down, bow down to Haman, and it's not the picture of, a, of a honoring a, a government official, it's more a picture of reverential awe. He wanted to assume the role of I own you. I'm better than you. I, I'm right up there with the gods. You need to bow down to me in, in religious fervor. And Mordecai said, I don't bow the knee to anybody but God. And so obviously that creates a thorn in your flesh. When one person is standing, everybody else is kneeling. And Mordecai was a Jew. And a Persian leader said, I don't like the Iranian leader said, I don't like a Jew. And I don't like this Jew not bowing down to me. In fact, I'm so mad I'm going to kill all the Jews. And we ought not be stunned. Truly, it doesn't take many of a group for us to say the whole group needs to be annihilated. We hate them all. We do that today. And so that happened then. One man was bad in their eyes. Mordecai was a champion of God, was seen as bad to the government, not not willing to submit, not willing to be cooperative. And so not only was he going to go, Haman said, I'll tell you what, Mr. King, I'll get rid of the whole lot of them for you. In fact, if you'll come down in your script in Esther chapter 3, look with me in and let's begin in verse 8. Haman informed the king, chapter 3, verse 8 of Esther. Haman informed the king, informed king Ahasuerus. There's only one ethnic group scattered. There's one ethnic group scattered throughout the peoples in every province of your kingdom, yet living in isolation. Now look at this. Here's the suspicion. It was the same with Christians in the first century. They said uh, the, the, the Romans and the seculars said, you Christians are cannibals. Why? Jesus said, if you don't eat my body, you don't belong to me. You are some kind of cult. Jesus said, you don't drink my blood, you're not mine. These are things that were said of Christians. They need to go. Those people are weird. They, they meet in small clusters. They don't serve the king. They have a king of another kingdom. They need to go. So anytime there's a group of people that are misunderstood, here we go. It says, what, what, what's the charge? It says in verse 8, their laws are different. Their laws are different. They don't follow the secular, secular leading. They, they defy the king's law. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate these people, Haman said. Verse 9, if the king approves, 
Let an order be drawn up authorizing their destruction. And look at this. I'll pay 10,000 talents, or if you have a Holman Bible, 375 tons of silver. Now, where in the world did he get 375 tons of silver? He doesn't have it. Where is he going to get it? He's just promised the king, I can, re- I can replenish all that you lost in that battle when you lost from a million men down to 5,000 and 400 ships. Your, your, your treasury is hurting. I can restock it. Where's he going to get 375 tons of silver? Not only kill the people that are Jewish, take all their possessions, and remember they're scattered in 127 provinces from Ethiopia to India. He said, if you take all their wealth, I guarantee you it'd be a minimum of 375 tons of silver go right back in your treasury. Well, that's a win-win for a king. He's got somebody willing to do his dirty work, got somebody willing to re- replenish his treasury, and all he's got to say, do is say, show me the document. So suddenly Xerxes, who's easily swayed, he's easily swayed like Herod, who would cut off the head of John the Baptist because he liked one sensual dance. This man it, it has gotten one person coming in at the right moment and say, I'll tell you what I'll do. I figured out a way to get your bank account back. All you got to do is kill all those Jews. By the way, there's one out there in the yard that doesn't even bow down to me. He needs to go. King, these people aren't in your favor. They don't follow our laws. They're not of us. We need to get rid of them. So here, here's, the, here's the plea. Verse 10, king removed his signet ring. Uh-oh. This, this is like giving a teenager your charge card. Because if I've got your signet ring, I can charge anything I want to do and say the king said it. Now he's suddenly got the authority of the king on his hand. It says the king removed the ring, verse 10, gave it to Haman from his finger, and gave it to, uh, uh, gave, uh, removed the ring and gave it to Haman. Verse 11, the king told Haman, the money and the people are given you, you do as you see fit quickly. The scribes wrote down the order. As you remember, and it's not just movie, it's so, they would take the fastest horses when the king issued a decree that's going to all the provinces, the best riders on the fastest horses to go as quickly as they could out to take the decree. Now, I don't know how long it takes to ride a horse from Susa to India. I don't know how, far, how long it takes to ride a horse from Iran to Ethiopia. But as fast as the legs of a horse would carry them, they were on their way. The decree went out. Everything was good. Bank, bank account was going to be uh, deposited. Not one tear was lost. Not one, nothing in Xerxes' heart had one ounce of pain for killing every Jew. I've often wondered, what, what did Adolf Hitler feel? I think nothing. What did he feel when he saw train loads and was reported train loads have gone to these camps to be, uh, for, for the ultimate solution, to be gassed? What did he feel? Nothing. See, see that's what an abortionist feels when he, day after day, does nothing but dismember babies and pull them out of the room. What do you feel? Nothing. I'm just looking at the bank account, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So how do we know that Ahasuerus didn't feel anything? It says in verse 15 of chapter 3, the couriers left, spurred on by royal command. In other words, go quickly. So that was their, that was their motivation. The law was issued in the fortress of Susa. And the king and Haman, they were so stressed, they sat down for a drink while the whole city of Susa was in great confusion. Why? Not all the Iranians, not all the Persians hated the Jews. Some were friends, some were dinner companions, some were neighbors, some worked with each other. And suddenly you say, I just heard the decree of the king and you're under threat of death. They weren't drinking. They didn't have a banquet that night and say, what a glorious day. They were terrified because they'd been decreed the 12th month. This is the first month of the year. In the 12th month, because that's when they cast the pur for the holiday Purim, on the 12th month of the year, on the 13th day, that's the equivalent of our March the 7th. Remember, the calendar of the Middle East was on a lunar calendar. So they got the decree about they got the decree in, in uh, April, and they said 12 months from now, in March the 7th, you're going to die. As I shared with you last week, the horror is not we're going to corral all the men and send the women off to some other camp. We're going to kill women children babies men elderly and all not one jew is to be alive the morning of the 14th day of the 12th month so the bible says when that happened the decree went out to give people time to prepare there's two groups one the jews had to prepare what do i want to do with my stuff 
If I do nothing, they're going to just take it. When they kill us, they'll just, they'll just liquidate it. It'll go to the government. By the way, it's what happens to your stuff if you don't have a will. You do have a will. You can alter that will by creating your own. If you don't have a will, the government says, just give us your stuff. That's exactly what happened. If you don't do something with your stuff, we're going to take it. 375 tons of silver is what we're hoping for. But they had a year to say, okay, you've been a friend to me. You've been a neighbor. Our children play together. I've worked at your factory. Uh, I've worked in your business. Let me give you my stuff because 12 months from now, I'm not going to need it. So you got 12 months to decide who gets what. But the city councils in each city had a dilemma. Because if you had several Jews in your community, 100, 150, 200, 500, 1,000, I don't know, some of these larger cities had a ton of them. On a single day, you're going to kill 100 people. Where are you going to bury 100 people? See, if you, you can't leave their bodies out on the ground because you're going to have rat, rats and vermin and diseases and all kinds of stuff, flies just out the wazoo. So what, what, what are you going to do with 100 bodies? you got to have time to prepare to dig a pit for one of two things, either a mass grave or a fire pit big enough you can build the biggest bonfire your city ever saw. By the way, bonfire comes from what? Bone fires. You're going to have the biggest bone fire you've ever seen because all these Jews on a single day are going to light up the whole kingdom of the Medo-Persian Empire from India to Ethiopia. Well, that's what happened last week. Here we go. Let's go to chapter 4 and see what happens here. Mordecai, chapter 4, verse 1. Mordecai learned all that had occurred. He heard the command. He heard. Now remember, he's got some position. Again, we're not sure what, but he always frequents the king's gate. He's in that area. So he has something that gives him a lot of mobility, and it's always in the upper end of town. He, he's got some kind of clout. Mordecai learned all that had occurred, and he tore his clothes. He didn't go say, well, I want to have a drink till I kind of think this through. Let me get a good, good tall glass of wine because I need some calm, clear-headed thinking. The minute he heard it, he tore his garment. It's a sign of deep grief. It's not the sign of casual concern. This is a picture when you rip your robe, you're saying, I'm bare to my soul. I'm brokenhearted to my core. So here's one Jew who hears what's about to happen and knows that all his people are now under sentence of death by decree of the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. And the law says what a king of the Medo-Persian Empire has written cannot be erased. Well, the decree's gone out. It's as good as it is the law. Mordecai learned that all that, all that had occurred, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth, by the way, originally was sackcloth, made of coarse stuff. But in the times, as times progressed gradually, at least in the times of Jesus, it was black goat hair. Why? The hair of a black, I'm told, I don't know, I don't raise goats, but I'm told the black hair of a goat, of a black goat, is very coarse. And so when you'd put on a when you'd put on a uh, when you'd put on sackcloth made of black goat's hair, and that's rubbing against your skin, it's terribly irritating. It's it, you're not going to be comfortable. It's a reminder, I, I'm not I'm not going to be comfortable through these days of grief. And so that hair picking into and pricking your skin is very very painful. So it says he put on sackcloth. Ashes is a picture of ruin. They only wore sackcloth in death times. Ashes were added if it's national trauma. Why? I've been reduced to ashes. I have nothing. Everything I was is gone. I've been consumed by whatever this is that's happened. So here's a man who says, I'm hurting myself. I'm reminding of the grief by wearing garments that leave me no comfort. I have no comfort. Everything in me is hurting. And I'm reduced to ashes both in my home, my family, my wealth, my income, and my very life. You wore ashes and sackcloth when it was a national or an ethnic uh, uh, tragedy so large that it affected your whole group. So when he puts on sackcloth and ashes, he's saying, I'm crushed. I cannot be comforted. This is Mordecai. And then look what he says. He crowd, cried loudly. You seen a funeral in the Middle East? They ain't like funerals in Oklahoma. I don't know how those women do it, but those Middle Eastern women, are like, la, 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 and they're hollering in the street, and the men beating themselves with their chest. I mean, it's, it's a wild experience. The Bible says here was one man near the king's gate, couldn't go in the palace, you're not going to take grief inside the palace. You're not going to do that. You'll die. But you can't do that. The Bible says he'd come to the king's gate and he was walking the streets crying and weeping loudly. In other words, this man wasn't just hurt. He wanted you to know he's hurt. He's wearing clothing that irritates him, ashes on his head. He's crying and moaning loudly. And he went only as far as the king's gate since the law prohibited anyone 
wearing sackcloth from England to King's Gate. Why? If you're wearing sackcloth, you're grieving. What was the penalty of making the king sad? <laughs> death, death. The king was supposed to be insulated from those mundane things like a person's sorrow because he's up here on a higher plane. So he could only go as far as the king's gate to keep, so because because if you went into the palace area, you could be punished with death because you brought grief and sorrow into the presence of the king. Verse 3. Not only was he weeping, but imagine the city of Susa. Now there's many Jews in the city, many in the provinces. There was great mourning. Now what are you going to hear? When these people weep, they don't weep quietly. Mourning is the sound of what would happen at the death of a friend. It's loud. It's on the street. It's, it's expressive. It doesn't say and they sit quietly in their homes and they, and, they, and they quietly console each other as they shed tears. It's not a picture of shedding. This thing's a picture of something audible and loud. They mourned all the Jewish people of every province where the king's command and edict had come. They fasted. And look at their response. They didn't demonstrate. I noticed this week one of the schools said, we're going to allow the students to demonstrate. Okay. When you've done that, what have you accomplished? Very little. What did these do? They said, we fasted. Why? God, we cannot eat. Number one, when you've just been sentenced to death, you're probably not hungry. Number two, when you've been sentenced to death, there's something more urgent than my next meal. If we don't get this edict change, I won't be worried about what I eat a year from now. The Bible says immediately they fasted two, th two reasons. Now, first of all, fasting says there is nothing as important to me today as getting in touch with God's heart. When you go through a period of fasting, you're saying, I, I, number one, I don't want to eat. But secondly, having food would be common compared to the burden of my heart, which is... A, uh, 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 far exceeding above what I feel at the moment by way of hunger. So the Bible says they responded with weeping, they responded with fasting, and they lamented. A lament is something that's loud, but it's also vocalized. We're going to look at one in a minute. And they lay on sackcloth and ashes. So the common man, if he was not wearing sackcloth and ashes, he would spread out a garment, likely at the door or the front of his house nearest the street, and he would sit on that garment and, and put ha ashes on his head, on his body. And he's out there moaning and crying out to God where everybody can hear him. Now, now I don't know about you. It, it, it's bad enough to hear one person wailing. It, it's painful enough in a nursing home to hear one crying out, Help me, help me, please help me. Don't walk by the door, help me. That, that's, that's tough. But what if you have a street lined with Jewish people in a Jewish quarter and here's everybody along the whole street and they're sitting in their, in their front lawn or front area nearest the street. And I mean a whole, every side, both sides of the street, every part as you can see, people are lamenting and wailing and weeping and crying and sitting on a uh, sackcloth and putting ashes on their head in deep contrition. What are you going to feel? Boy, that's, that's cute. Let's, let's go out and get something to eat. I'm, I'm hungry. Uh -uh. And by the way, you didn't drive by that, you had to walk by that. They didn't have subways, they didn't have buses, they didn't have cars. You, you couldn't roll up the window at 71st and Memorial say, I don't see you. Uh, they're everywhere. And so the Bible says while the king is there having a cool one with his henchman Haman, the people are broken. A and the friends of these Jews are broken because these are the people I know, these are the people I've worked with. And there's a sense of real brokenness in the community. So the Bible says here, they're lamenting. Now, I want, I want you to look with me real quickly because sometimes we don't understand lament. Turn in the, do you know there's one book in the Bible called Lamenting? Lament, very good, Lamentations. You've heard, look with me, Lamentations, right after the book of Jeremiah. He lamented, Jeremiah, you remember, was called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah's the man that was said, said before God, I wish my head were a bucket that I might weep tears day and night for my people. I mean, this guy was broken. Here in Lamentations, look, let's understand what a lament, what a lament sounds like when it's verbalized. Now, I don't know exactly what they were saying, but this is a pretty good example. By the way, if you've got a Holman Bible or a more recent translation, you'll notice at the top of each verse, there's a, there's a word and a symbol. That's the Hebrew letters. That's the Hebrew alphabet. So what Jeremiah is doing is he's writing this lament. He said, like our early, uh, our early English primers, uh, he would say, A, all of sin comes short of the God, uh, glory of God. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. That was the textbook in school. <laughs> what 
way back. When this nation started, it wasn't Christian. We just happened to find that and printed it. You know, that, that's, that was just by accident. We weren't really Christian. You know, you, you read our history. We weren't Christian. They just found that book and thought that'd be a good way to learn. And so they learned the, they learned the alphabet by learning Bible. I don't know if you know, we don't do that anymore. You know, we've outgrown that as a night. You, you, you look stunned, but I'll just tell you, your tax dollars at work have removed that because that, that would be far awful if they were to learn the Ten Commandments and Scripture. You, you know, you know. It'd be, yeah, why do y'all look so glazed? You look like a Krispy Kreme shop. You know, they're, they're, they don't do that anymore. Well, this is exactly what Jeremiah did when he listed these laments. He said, when I think of the first Hebrew letter, here's what I think of. When I think of the second Hebrew letter, here's what I think of. So we come down to chapter 1 in Lamentations. Look with me in Lamentations. Let's, let's begin here in, in verse 2 of Lamentations. because It's a picture. I'm sorry. But begin with me in chapter, uh, chapter uh, 1. Look with me get, beginning in verse 11. Chapter 1, verse 11. All the people groan. Now imagine you're in Susa. Here's the picture. All the people groan. They search for bread, meaning suddenly their livelihood is in jeopardy or cut off. Now, this isn't Susa, but you get an idea of what a lament sounds like. The people are groaning. They search for bread. They've traded their precious belongings for food to stay alive. Lord, look and see how I've become despised. Look at verse 12. Is nothing to you all you is this nothing to you, you who pass by? When somebody's really hurting and, they, and you watch folks go the other way, you say, do you not see me? You had a death in the family, a tragic death. If so, the minute you hear that and you go by a place and people are still cutting up and laughing and caring, everything in you suddenly just feels angry and you're thinking, they, they don't know, but if you knew, surely you'd grieve for me. Well, that's the picture. How can you walk by me? Look at verse 12. Is this nothing to you? You who pass by, Lamentations 1.12, look and see, is there any pain like mine? You ever felt that way? This which has been dealt out to me, which the Lord made me suffer on the day of his burning anger. He sent fire from on high into my bones. He made it to descend, the fire descended. He spread a net for my feet and he turned me back. He made me desolate, sick all day long. My transgressions have been formed. Now look at this. This is a powerful picture of a man who realizes I'm in trouble because something I did. My transgressions have been formed into a yoke, fastened together by the hand of God. They have been placed on my neck, and the Lord has broken my strength. He handed me over to those I cannot withstand. What brought the yoke around my neck? He says, this is a result of my own deeds. You know the person who feels most miserable when they get caught in something they shouldn't have done? is the person who says, I have nobody to blame but myself. This lament, he says, I, I'm guilty. I, I formed the very yoke that's now uh, creating such pain for me. Now, look at verse 16. I weep because of these things. My eyes flow with tears, for there is no one nearby to comfort me, no one to keep me alive. My children are desolate because the enemies prevail. You get the idea. So the Bible says here in, in Esther chapter 4, the people were weeping, and there are lines of them, blocks of them, the streets of them. It says they're weeping. They fasted, lamented, many lay on sackcloth. Uh, chapter 4, verse 4 of Esther, look with me. Here, here's what's happening in the palace. Esther 4, verse 4. Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to Esther, and the queen was overcome with fear. What news did they report? Bits and pieces. Now, in case you've got this picture of this happy little fairy tale where the princess wears the glass slipper and suddenly lives with the prince, he becomes the king, and they live together and sleep together and eat together and do everything together. That's a bad picture. Throw that out. That's called fairy tale. In the days of Susa, you had two groups. First of all, you had a wife, a queen, to serve in the regal performances, presentations. You'd have a queen if and when you were ready to have a birth a baby praying it was a boy so he could be the king to come but then you had numerous concubines that would also provide heirs to do different jobs in and around the royal family and so you'd keep the concubines in your area they lived and enjoyed the benefit of the king but they were not royal they were never considered to be of the royal lineage but they certainly had access to the king for lots of reasons including reproduction if he needed to have additional help. But there's another picture here. The Bible says that this queen was in the palace, but she was not in the king's chambers. You're going to read, and we're going to see in a minute where she was afraid to enter the king's presence without it being summoned. 
So being a queen didn't mean I can go in any time you want to. No, the king was the ultimate potentate. You may wear the crown of the queen, but that's at the banquet. That's at the ribbon cuttings. That's at things of court. I, have, I may have children with the queen, but that's yet to be determined. I have many children, and we know that's true. Kings would say, I have many children from all of my concubines. But there's another purpose the queen serves, and then one she does not serve. She serves, the, she serves in the role of giving the king a proper appearance. Everything in court is all about how do you look. Was it, was it done well? Is it done with elegance? Does she look the role? That's why I was very interested in having a beautiful young virgin from somewhere within the 127 provinces. I want to look good when I step out before the people. So the queen had to be an eye catcher, a very nice compliment to him. However, in that day and age, the queen most often had no access to the king unless requested. In other words, they didn't go to bed together at night. They weren't in the same room. They didn't get up and use the same bathroom in the morning. They had very little contact unless he requested it. The truth is the king had concubines to satisfy his pleasure, concubines to provide other children not royal lineage to take the throne, and a queen for appearance, a queen for personal, uh, personal events that the king was going to host, and a queen to represent the face of the kingdom to the common man. So here's Esther. Here's what it says. She heard from the servants, not the king. She didn't know the king had given the decree. How did she know? Likely she could hear the lamenting and the weeping. And the servants were out doing shopping and other things. They came in and said, Susa is in a real turmoil. Why? And she's sitting there totally ignorant. She has no knowledge of what's happened. The female servants and eunuchs in verse 4 came and reported the news to her. And the queen was overcome with fear. Why? They knew enough to say something. Because, see, they didn't realize she is a Jew. She had never told them who she is. She didn't know. They didn't know she was a Jew. And so they're just saying, well, you know, the decree's going to, all those Jews are going to die. Not dreaming that the queen I serve is one of those people. She's never told it. Mordecai said, don't you tell who you are. And she's never betrayed the fact that, she, portrayed the fact that she's, she's a Jew. So look what happens. The, the servants and eunuchs come and they reported the news to her. And the queen was overcome with fear. She sent clothes to Mordecai to wear so he'd take off that sackcloth and come in and explain it to her. Why? I want to hear it from Uncle Mordecai. I want to know exactly what's happening. Take off those clothes. Tell him to take off that stuff he's wearing in grief. Put on these clothes and come in the palace and explain it to me. But boy, Mordecai wasn't going to give up his grieving for an opportunity to explain something to her. It says... He wouldn't take them off. He wouldn't take off his sackcloth. He didn't accept them. Verse 5, so Esther summoned a eunuch named Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to her, and they dispatched him to Mordecai to learn what Mordecai was doing and why. You would think she would know. But keep in mind, she's gotten bits and pieces from a group of servants, and she doesn't have the whole picture. She says, I, I've only heard a brief breaking news report. I need somebody to explain to me what's happened. Come in and tell me. He wouldn't go in, so she sent a servant out to say, get him to tell you. Why is he doing this? Verse 6, Hatak went out to Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him everything that had happened, as well as the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the slaughter of all the Jews. And Mordecai gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa, ordering the Jews' destruction so that Hathach might show it to Esther. Now he could show the decree. Why? I don't want you to think this is just a rumor mill among the Jewish people that are afraid. How did he have a copy? How did he have a copy of the edict? I don't know. Somewhere in there, Mordecai had access to royal privilege that we're not told. He had a very he had a copy of the very edict. It was being issued in 127 provinces. It says, take this to her so she can see, so she can see that written decree issued in Susa. Now look what it says. So that Hatak might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and instruct her to approach the king, implore his flavor, and plead with him personally. Now pause a minute. Wait a minute. She's the queen. He's got to explain to her the edict of the king. Why? Ladies, you live in a marvelous era. 
it has not always been marvelous for you, and to hear some tell it's not marvelous now. But there was a day when you were little better than a cow in the stall or a pig in the pen. You were purchased for service. You were expected to give service to your husband, meaning you provided housekeeping, you provided children for him, you provided the needs of the home, and that's really about it. You didn't vote. Most women could not read. Most were illiterate, and certainly in biblical times. One of the ways to control any group of people is keep them illiterate. Well, if you keep an entire gender illiterate, it's very hard for them to know enough to, to rebel much because they say, we don't know enough to know what to do. It's very likely Esther could not read. She came into Mordecai's house as a child. It was not expected for a girl to learn to read. You say, but when she became a queen, she was trained. She was trained in things like horsemanship, archery, ways to make people happy at court, meaning I can talk enough about court issues or life to keep you entertained. She likely never learned to read. That was not at all unusual. Though she was the queen, she would depend on her husband to tell her what she needed to know. So here's the dilemma. The king issues an edict. She can speak Hebrew, has learned to speak Persian, but she doesn't understand necessarily the terms of the contract. And why would he do this? She, what she didn't understand is the rationale and then the reality, this is really going to happen. So he, he says to Hathak, you go explain this to her. Now remember, she's still very young. She's illiterate. Her background is not Persia. She's a Jew. She's trying to get her arms around what this is that my husband has done. And listen, she's terrified because she knows he's capable of violence. She knows he can kill. She knows she's seen him execute people and have them executed. He deposed Vashti because he just didn't like her. So him saying to Esther, get out of my palace, was not beyond the pale. So here Mordecai says in verse 8, you give her a copy of the decree, you explain to her what's happened, instruct her to approach the king and do this. Listen, don't you tell, tell her not to send a request, not to send, have one of the servants write down her request and send it on paper. You go personally. Why? The reason I don't always like email. I can say something to you verbally, and you can see my facial expression, hear my voice inflection, and know what I'm saying because you see my heart and my face. I can send you the same email, cold turkey, and you'll read it, and two words will say, What did he mean by that? Right? Y'all ever use email? Yeah. So what happened? If I don't do it verbally, face to face, I can make you think, or you can leave thinking, He's mad or he's upset or what did he mean by that? He said, listen, if you send him a note, he can take that any number of ways. He likes you. You found favor in his eyes five years ago or you wouldn't be queen. He likes you enough to make you queen of the kingdom. You need to go him personally. And now it's time. Now look what he's saying. When you go this time, you're going to have to tell who you are. Now let that sink in just a minute. A decree's just gone out. Every Jew is to die in the 12th month of this year on the 13th day. You called Haman in to give you some encouragement. He's not coming. So when you go back out, send your servant back out to say, find out why he comes back with the message. Not only am I not coming in, I want you to come out. I want you to come out of your chamber and I want you to go in the chamber, the throne room of the king and I want you to plead to him face to face and you for the first time take off the mask and you tell him, I am a Jew. The very group you're trying to kill are my people. Mordecai that made Haman mad is my uncle. Mordecai is the one that sent me for the audition to be your queen. Mordecai is the one that told you there were men wanting to kill you and an assassination plot was happening at the gate and you said he did good because you hung the two guys guilty. I am one of those very people that Haman hates and that you've said got to die. I'm here to plead for my people. Now, she knows Xerxes. He was mad enough in one impulse to get rid of Ashley and now she's standing there totally exposed saying, guess who I am? In case you were thinking he sent word to her to comfort her, ladies, he did not. 
where she was hoping to get a pat on the back and say, now it's going to be all right. Don't, you don't have to fight this one. You're up there where it's safe in the palace. Let us fight this one. You pray for God's favor. He said, it's time for you to join us to push back against that which is evil and stand for your God and for your people. There comes a time. So that's what he said. He said, listen, I want you to implore his favor. I want you to do it face to face. Verse 8, last phrase, I want you to plead with him personally. So it's not, uh, 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 your, your highness, I, I'm here as your queen, and I just would like to ask you maybe reconsider that edict you wrote. Thank you, bye. Listen, when a man sends word to a, a lady, I want you to plead with your husband. Now, women... You know pleading is what you do when you really got something you want done. And John Brown, y'all are good at it. You have a method and a way about you that when you really want something done, you can say to that husband in your life, I'm really serious, I need this. And boy, you'll, you'll plead in a manner that gets to his heart. It's, unlike, it's not like a note on the refrigerator. It's not like a note you leave on the kitchen counter. It's that face-to-face, I need to talk to you visit. And it's a very, when I say pathos-filled, I mean deep emotion. It's that time when your heart is in your hand. Your eyes convey the brokenness in your spirit. Your, your countenance shows the heaviness of your request. This isn't a passing, I wish you would. This is that urgent, I need you now. Time for you to stand up and do something about it. It has got to happen. So he says to her, I want you to plead with him. That, that's what it says in, in verse 9. You go to him personally and you plead. You plead with him for your people. Now, now again, ladies and gentlemen, th- this is the difference. He's not saying, Esther, you need to plead for your life because you're the queen. He's going to kill you. He said, you need to plead in your position for a whole group of people of whom you're a part. Now I want you to hear me. Every one of us have a circle of influence. We either use it to promote, pull people closer to God or pull them away from God. He said it's time. And by the way, it is time. It's time you use your influence. He said, listen, you can't just keep living the good life and bathing in the nice oils and having the servants meet your every need and and say, this is just so good, it's never going to end. He said, if you don't change something quick, it's going to end for everybody you know. Your whole bloodline is about to be eradicated in this kingdom. You need to plead for your people. Now, now that's an urgent request. Now, now look, look, look what happens. Esther's already afraid. But when she hears from Mordecai, instead of getting comforted, she gets discomfited. <laughs> Look at verse 10. Esther spoke to Hathak. She commanded him. Now she's re- using that regal. First she sent him on a mission. Now she's commanding him. She's using her position. You get back out there. And here's what happened. She spoke to Hathak and commanded him to tell Mordecai. All the royal officials, she said, listen, here's something you don't understand, Mordecai, about this palace and how things work. All the officials and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every person, queen, king, queen, prince, or anybody else. It applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courtyard and who has not been summoned. If you've not been called by the king and you go in without being invited, what do you get? Death. Only if the king extends the golden scepter will that person live. I have not been summoned to be before the king for 30 days. A response was reported. Now look what she just said. I cannot enter unless I'm invited. Western Christianity is so weak because we have no clue what the Bible teaches. Oh, we read it. And we even do Greek studies, and we understand syntax and background, but we don't get it. Because we've never been under a king. For some reason, in Western Christianity, we think we have this freedom to bounce into God's presence when it's convenient and bounce out when we don't want to go. We can go weeks or months or years at a time. As long as we prayed the prayer when we were eight, we're good. And, and, and you know, he's just fortunate to have me. I mean, he just loves me. I'm just like a grandchild. I can't do any wrong in his eyes. He's going to just overlook it, snicker at He just knows me. It's all right between me and him. 
what a joke and not a good joke. What we've forgotten is the sovereign God of the ages is an omnipotent potentate. The Bible says the earth trembles in his presence. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. The Bible says the thunderclaps are to honor his creative power. The hail in Psalm 150 praises God. Those strong winds that blow at his command are a demonstration of his power. You know what we say? Well, I'm, I, I may not, I don't really feel like honoring him. I don't, I don't think you have to. <laughs> Even Esther said, if I go into his presence uninvited, I'm going to die. Now, can I take one quick caveat and fast forward you to the New Testament? And we're going to grow it right back and finish. We serve an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternally powerful, fearful, awesome, holy, righteous God. Now, hear me. We have no access to him in and of ourselves. None. Why? Even Moses, when he asked for the privilege of seeing God in his splendor, God said, Moses, I love you too much to say yes. Because if you saw me as I am in your state as you are, because I am totally righteous and you are sinful, because I am holy and you are wicked in your core, you are a man, you have sinned against God, on your best day you have sinned against God. If I in all my purity were to come into your presence or you into mine as you are now, I would consume you. No, you may not see me in my glory. So can I fast forward to the New Testament? We can't go in the presence of the king as we are. We're not robed for it. We're not right at the core to do it. And furthermore, we don't have any access. There's nobody, nobody in the Old Testament had come to take us in. And then can I take you to the gospel? Jesus said, I've come as the son of man. To seek and to save all you who are on the outside and have no access. Do you hear his word? Do you get the invitation? Come. 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 So how do I get to go into the presence of God? I've been invited by the Son of the Almighty. So that when I come into his presence, I'm not coming in as Nick Garland. I'm coming, standing with Jesus Christ, covered in his righteousness, who made the way open for me and has invited me into the presence of the king so I will not be cast down or killed for entering ill-advised. That ought to make us shudder when we pray. I'm not just talking to somebody. I'm talking to the Lord of glory. Esther said, I can't go in before the king. He hadn't even talked to me. He hadn't summoned me in 30 days. Now, there's a lot you can read into that. One is you can say maybe he had had a lot of things going on in the kingdom. And he had said, Esther, I'm not going to see you for a while. We have many different heads of state coming in and groups from these provinces. I'm going to be busy. I won't have time for you. Some have read into that there was a rift between them, as can happen. And that for some reason, because of that rift, she had said, He's not spoken to me in 30 days. He's not asked me into his presence. And now you want me to go with this level of request? Some have read in the 30 days that suddenly the king had said to her, really, I'm wondering if I want you still as my queen. I've got all these concubines. I'm doing good. I've got opportunities now to grow. I'm not sure I made a wise choice. I, I don't know why he hadn't called her. But a month had gone by since she even heard him say, come see me. That's not real good. If you're a month away, month of, month of separation from your husband, and you live under the same roof in the same palace, if you live in the same house with your husband and you hadn't spoken in 30 days, that's probably not a good sign. The Bible says when this summons came from Mordecai, she said, I can't do that because to enter his presence without being summoned is a sure death penalty. And I haven't spoken to him in 30 days. He's not summoned me in 30 days. And she said to Hathak, you take that back to Mordecai and you tell him. 
And then Mordecai makes that marvelous statement we've shared so many times. Mordecai said to the messenger, the eunuch sent by Esther, he said, I want you to go back and tell her this, this one thing. You tell her, I'm her uncle and I love her. She doesn't get it. Now, I want you to hear me. She doesn't get it. If she doesn't stand now, she'll not be allowed to stand later. Are you listening? If she doesn't stand now, it won't matter a year from now. If she doesn't do the right thing now, she won't have to worry about doing it later. She won't be here. She won't be alive. Look what he says to her. Don't think, verse 13, don't think, Esther, that you're going to escape the fate of all the Jews because you live in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this moment in time, I have enough faith in God. Here's what he's saying. I believe God will send liberation deliverance for his people from another place. But Esther, if you balk now, you and all in your father's house are going to be destroyed with every other Jew. Esther, here's what you need to consider. Have you ever thought about this? Who knows? Maybe you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, maybe your beauty got you in. Maybe the seam and time between Vashti's not showing up at the banquet and you being old enough to be presented as a candidate, God knew when you needed to be born to make that happen. You and I both know there's no reason for a Jew to be in the royalty in Iran. You have to at least ask the question, God, why did you let this happen? Mordecai says, Esther, now we know. Now we know. For such a time as this, God put you in this position. And verse 15, Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Then here's what I want you to do, Mordecai. Verse 16, you go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa. And you fast for me. Don't you eat or drink anything for three days. That's different from Ramadan with the Muslims. They can not eat or drink anything by day, but they can feast at night during the month of Ramadan. They call it a fast, but they can eat at night and drink at night. They just can't do it during the daytime. She says, for three days. Now, listen, you go three days without water, you're getting close to problem. You can go three days without food and be fine, but three days without water, you're going to be in a problem if you don't get something. So she said, the maximum time, three days and three nights, no food or no drink. And during that time, you begged them to pray. And she said, I'm not asking you to do something I'm not going to do. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. And after that, I'm going to go to the king. And if it's against the law and he kills me, look at this. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had ordered him to do. What does that mean? There comes a time when you say, why am I here? Why am I living in 2017? Why in such a turbulent time in our, in our nation am I allowed to have life? It's not just to suck in air and eat and drink and be merry. Why am I here? Perhaps you remember like Joseph, taking at 17, thinking God loved him, thinking at 17, God, you must not love me much. I've, I've been taken from my brothers and taken as a slave and put into a prison. I thought you loved me. But for such a time as this, God put Joseph in Egypt so in the midst of a famine, his family and all the Jews could be fed from all the bounty of grain in Egypt for such a time as this. For such a time as this, he put a little baby boy in the reeds in an ark that was sealed, a basket was sealed with pitch and had mama and sister, had sister watching over him. And when he was, Moses means taken from the water, when he was taken by the, from the water from the very household, where was Esther? In the household of the man that had predicted and made an edict of death from the household of Pharaoh who had said, don't you dare let any of those Jewish babies live. His own daughter found one, and for a time such as this, he not only lived, he thrived in the household of Pharaoh and became the person who would stand in Pharaoh's face and say, let my people go for such a time as this. For such a time as this, God sent a man named Joshua. With the death of Moses, wondered what in the world we're going to do. Four times in Joshua 1, the Bible says, do not be afraid. Fear not, do not be afraid. 
Why? Because that's what he felt. But he sent Joshua to lead those people, now having completed 40 years in the wilderness, to see the Jordan River part and take them into the land of promise for such a time as this. When the land of Israel had become so corrupt that they were worshiping the idols and following after the gods of Baal and Ashtoreth, God raised up one man named Elijah. And he said, for such a time as this, Elijah, you go to the top of Mount Carmel and you do what I tell you. You repair the altar that's not been in operation in years. And you gather 12 barrels of water once you've killed a bullock and put wood on it. The most precious thing in famine is water. You get the most precious thing you got and we'll do business. You get 12 barrels of water. Wherever you find it, gather up 12 barrels and you dump that on that altar. And when the fire falls, we'll let Israel decide who's God for such a time as this. Now I want you to hear me. Throughout history, there have been men in such a time as this when they knew that they had no option. They took a stand and we forever revered them. I think about the Archbishop Thomas Beckett in the days of Henry II, 1170. That's been a while. Thomas Beckett was a best friend of Henry. They grew up together, had times together, laughed together. And when time came to make him the Archbishop of Canterbury, Henry II said, I'll have my best friend, I'll have my man. He'll do anything I want. Boy, was he wrong. Because the minute Thomas Beckett was made Archbishop of Canterbury, he said, I can no longer bow to the king, for I have a greater king to whom I'm responsible. He stood against the laws of Henry, and Henry didn't like it. Kings don't like to be told, I'll not do what you say. And the decree went out, and Henry II sent four knights to Canterbury. Beckett heard there was a group coming, but he said, it's time for a service at the cathedral. While leading the service, he climbed the altar of his church. It was prayerful, and four knights pulled their swords in the church and hacked him to pieces. Thomas Beckett made the statement, if all before he died, he said, if all the swords in England were pointed against my head, your threats, Henry, would not move me. I'm ready to die for my Lord that in my blood the church may obtain liberty and peace. I don't have to tell you, we're two weeks from Memorial Day, uh, one week away from Memorial Day, and I remember the great patriots, and so many have made powerful statements. Nathan Hale, once he was discovered, said, I regret that I have only one life to give for my country. I think about the powerful man Patrick Henry, and Janine and I stood in that church some years ago when we went to Richmond. The last part of his speech said, Is life so dear, peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Mordecai wrote to his sweet little niece. He said, young lady, you've gotten really comfortable in there in the palace. I can understand that. But you're about to die. You can stay silent and you'll die just like every other Jew at the sword of a wicked king and you'll be no different than the blood of others. But there's just an opportunity, there's a possibility if you'll exude your strength and stand in the grace of God, who knows, but for a time such as this, you'll sway the heart of that king and turn it from his murderous threats against the Jews to really see Haman for what he is. She said, that's going to take an act of God. Yes. Now, people who said the problem with Esther, it doesn't mention the name God, or when you're fasting and praying, who are you talking to? She said, for three days you have everybody in Susa pray. I wonder what happened if for three days every Christian in America prayed for three days. What if McDonald's had to shut down for three days because every Christian in America said, we're not eating for three days? What, what, what if businesses said, I don't know what's going to happen. Those Christians aren't showing to the Lord. Their prayer meeting was their church. What if it would happen in America for three days, every Christian, every Christian called on God in prayer? Esther said to Mordecai, I can't do this unless God helps me. You tell every Every Jew you know, you tell them, pray and fast for me for three days. I'm not asking at the end of three days whether or not I'll make the decision. I'm going to go. But he said, if they've prayed, and she said, if they've prayed and fasted for me, I know when I go, I don't go in my might or my beauty or my power or my role as queen. If you'll pray and fast, when I walk in the king's presence, I'm walking in the presence, in the presence of a greater king. 
And the king in whose presence I walk holds in his hand the potentates of earth. If you'll pray and fast and I know I'm going the power of God, I will not be afraid. I will go see the king. I will do what you've requested. Mordecai said, that's all I'd want to know. She said, no, there's one other thing. Mordecai, if I go before the king and he kills me, I went trying to do good for my people. You tell them. If I don't get any further than the entrance point of his chamber, of his throne room, if I only get that far, and he says, get that woman out of here, because I don't know why she hadn't been summoned in three days. And furthermore, he says, who do you think you are coming into my presence without being summoned? Off with you. She said, if he kills me, he kills me. Mordecai, you know the truth. After people have prayed for me for three days and three nights and fasted and prayed for three days and three nights and focused only on the will of God for his people for three days and three nights, I'm not going as the queen of Persia. I'm going as a child of God. And I'm going to do what he tells me and what he's confirmed in the prayers of his people because now I take off this crown of King Xerxes' donation. Today I put on the crown of of righteousness as a child of God I will not bend I will not break I will not bow until I've done what the Lord has told me short of a miracle one day real soon I pray for I pray for the rapture I do but if it doesn't come one day real soon you're either going to be silent for one day too long are you going to stand because you say, I, I can't stand anymore? I will not bend. I will not bow. I will not break. Dr. Martin Luther King had a quote at the height of the civil rights movement. Here's what he said. Cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it popular? Conscience asks the question, is it right? But there comes a time when a person must take the position, it's not safe. And it's not popular. But we're going to have to do it because it's right. When Mordecai sent word to Esther, he said, the die is cast. She said, I understand it now. I just need an explanation. I get it. I'm going to go after I've prayed up and you've prayed up for me. But I want one thing known. If I succeed, God did it. If I die in the throne room of the king, you can say, I know why she died, Jews. She went as our ambassador to stand for an earthly king. And for whatever reason, God said no. Today we face God knowing that he sent a messenger. And he said, I have every confidence she will not fail. She will have the favor of God, and we're going to hear good things. You know why we're reading about Esther? She didn't die. And she wasn't under the hand of an earthly sovereign. She was in the hands of the Almighty. That's a mighty good place to stand. I want you to pray with me. Father, Esther is such a marvelous study because it's about a person who really, just like us, came from a small town in Persia somewhere out in one of the provinces to come into the king's palace. She was awed by the power of government. She loved the regality of the court. A little poor little girl had her Cinderella dream made true and goodness, everything was going so well. And suddenly, it's like America, where for so many years, it was just so wonderful. Everybody had a similar worldview, and not all were in church, but at least their mom had taught them about God, and schools taught them about God, and the government acknowledged there's a God, and there's at least a central belief that we are accountable to somebody bigger than you and me. But Father, we got over that. Now we're in the days of judges, where every man does what's right in his own eyes. And sadly, the day, the day is coming when Christians are going to be that group that's considered hateful because we don't endorse all the immorality and all the debauchery. We don't live in a world filled with animal lust. We, we don't live that way. And that makes us very suspect. So God, what I pray we'll do is be bold in our study and faithful in our prayer 
so that when the time comes that we stand, we don't falter, and we don't waver, we don't bend, we don't bow, and we don't break. But I pray that folks will know when we were called on, we stood faithful. And like Esther, we say, if I perish, I'm going to be with God. If I succeed, I'm going to see our people delivered. May we have that same boldness. I sure thank you for these folks who come week after week to study, not just for that which is popular, but for that which is powerful. We cannot read the book of Esther without seeing our own parallel in our generation. May we too be found faithful when the time comes for us to stand for the king, the king of glory, before whom we live our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.